Thank you. Well, uh, I hope everybody's partaken of a convivial, if uh, solitary, conference lunch. And um, welcome back. <clears throat> what we want to do is move ourselves slightly north from the um, focus of many previous papers. I think for me, one of the um, personal things that I've found interesting has been all the talk of new models and resolving of kind of hints of, of data and things uh, to do with the Northern North Sea. And uh, it'll be good to kind of push that back a bit further, um, particularly for those of us interested in the early peopling of Scotland. But um, it's also interesting that Obviously, we're very much here, um, driven by the ELF project. Um, a lot of the focus of work has been further south. Um, so what's going on in the north? What's the potential of the north? Well, there's certainly, even if we're looking at, even if we're talking about um, earlier coastlines being closer in um, to the present shore, there is potential in Scotland, um, unlike, the sort of memories that many of us may have of fantastic pictures of raised beaches in old school geography books and things, much of Scotland is in fact a submerging landscape or perhaps more accurately, it's a very complex picture of both submergence and uh, emergence as you can see from the um, isobase model on screen just now. Um, so, What's going on here? Why do we hear less about it? Well, yes, um, I think that uh, it's true to say that it's partly an artifact of research. Perhaps we haven't had the big projects. Things like the Aggregates Levy Fund was never really available for work in Scottish waters. Um, work uh, is ongoing just now. and. Um, we can perhaps think about two areas in particular. There's been a lot of work done, particularly on the intertidal zone in the west of Scotland, both on um, western coastlines, but right out across the islands, out to the um, coastline of, of the Long Island, for example, Lewis Harris down to Barra. But what I want to do, as um, Helen said in, uh, in our paper, is I'm going to look at work in the archipelago of Orkney, um, which um, we've been undertaking for several years just now. And here I'm talking about the work of the Rising Tide project, which has been active in Orkney since 2005. And as you can see um, from the screen, really we've been crossing the boundary. We've been working both uh, drawing data on land in the intertidal zone and underwater. And um, we've several published papers now and more kind of lurking in the pipeline. So i um, happy to pass on references and things to people if you're interested in that. Um, the project is really driven by landscape change, uh, by the changing shape of the archipelago in Orkney, of Orkney, um, through the period of uh, human settlement here, uh, right from earliest times. And it's a picture of landscape change that's very much driven by changes in relative sea level. It is um, a slowly, a slowly submerging landscape. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's extensive areas of submerged landscape. Um, and indeed, the very earliest archaeological record is somewhat fragmentary up here. So perhaps for me as an archaeologist, one of the big questions has been how much uh, is the fragmentary nature of the archaeology due to uh, sites being uh, on a now seabed landscape and how much um, is it related to other things? Obviously, in order to understand the communities who've lived in Orkney in the past, we have to know what the islands look like. And we also have to understand the dynamic landscape within which they lived, the, the way in which change was a part of their lifestyle. So um, to start, perhaps one of the first things we did really was try to build um, a sea level curve for Orkney. And you can see here uh, data points and um, 
in fact, it seems like a, a while ago now, but um, what we found was that uh, C has only reached present um, height, roughly present height, around about 4,000, three and a half thousand years ago. And in many ways, this was at the time quite a surprise. As I say, personally, I'm very driven by hunter gatherers, not that I'm not interested in more recent people. Um, but um, it was this thought that we actually had uh, the potential of a more recent archaeological landscape was something that interested us and um, if you like added an extra dimension to the project and indeed one of the interesting things about this was the fact that of course uh, the hunter-gatherer footprint is notoriously elusive it's elusive on land never mind um, underwater but when we're talking about some of the more recent archaeology of, of Orkney in particular the Neolithic archaeology, the first farmers, um, you're talking about a fantastic stone built record. And so was there the possibility that we had stone built uh, monuments, stone built remains in the underwater landscape? That was um, something that kind of was added in to, to the mix excitingly. Um, and that's really in a way what uh, I'd like to talk a bit more about now. Well, Obviously, Orkney is a very small archipelago, but um, in fact, what we very quickly realised was that despite the, the small size of the archipelago, the sort of generalised models of sea level change that one might work with, even where you're building um, your own sea level curves and things, that these models remain very general when you're trying to talk about the impact of landscape change on a particular community or on the area around a specific site. And so one of the things that we've been working on is trying to take um, very particular topographic units, if you like, and build more detailed models that are more meaningful in a community sense. And um, so that's one of the things that we've been working on. And here you can see one of our main focuses of interest, the Bay of Firth, and some of the results that have come from work uh, in and around the Bay of Firth. Now we had several reasons for moving to the Bay of Firth. Um, it's a nice sheltered bay right at the heart of the archipelago. Um, but the, it's got a very good archaeological record, both around it, on the shores around the bay, and also on the islands, which you can see in the centre of the bay there. But one of the interesting things about the Bay of Firth is that there's a very strong uh, tradition of oral history relating both to um, places. There's a lot of stories about people doing things um, out on areas of land that are now underwater. So those stories of funeral processions being washed away, trying to get out to the island of Damsey. Let me bring up my um, laser pointer. Yeah, this is the island of Damsey here. And those stories about people crossing over to Damsey and being washed away and things. And there's also a strong tradition of um, divers. It's a rich area for both oysters, scallops, lobsters and things. Um, there's a lot of stories about divers finding sites, swimming through arches and into um, chamber tombs and things. Uh, and so it seemed that this was an area that um, was worth investigation. And you can see here some of the very detailed models that we've managed to draw up, looking at the way in which the nature of the bay has changed through time. And I think one of the, the big things about this is that um, the realization came that submergence, that inundation, wasn't just a process of attrition, but you're also talking about things like for example, the impact on the intertidal zone, that that's not always a negative as the landscape changes. And particularly when you're talking about the hunter-gatherers, um, that um, in Scotland, we tend to assume that our hunter-gatherer communities, that many of them are very much coastal specialists. Uh, we talk, we teach students about the importance of the intertidal zone. And here we are with a much greater intertidal zone in the past than we actually have in the present. You can see how 
the reduction in intertidal zone only really takes place as we approach the present day, which was uh, an interesting thing. So we can build these um, models for specific uh, parts of Orkney. Um, we can look at the relationship with existing terrestrial sites. We can begin to think about the potential impacts of inundation on the, the communities living on these sites. Um, but what about the sites underwater? And this is where things have perhaps become a, a little bit more difficult. I think when we started out, we all had hopes very much of um, the sort of Danish type landscape. Of course, Orkney is a very, very different place, really known for its high energy waters. So perhaps we were a little naive right from the start. Um, I think many people will be aware of all the re marine renewable work going on around Orkney. It's perhaps not the most obvious place to be looking for archaeology. But there are places that what we've found is um, by targeting more sheltered and specific areas. Um, so that's what we've been working on. But actually populating the submerged landscape with sites, even when we've been doing things like predictive modelling, has proved more difficult. And what I want to just talk about um, in particular today, perhaps um, slightly less the hunter-gatherer footprint. I think we've been hearing a lot about that um, out in the North Sea and things. But what's very much come home to us is the issue of um, stone-built remains, those elusive, well, they're not elusive if you're on land. Um, it's what's attracted fantastic community of archaeologists to Orkney over the years. Um, and of course, uh, the advantage um, that one has is that bedrock in Orkney is a fantastic natural building material and people in the past, as indeed today, really take advantage of that. But the problem for us as archaeologists is that that very use of the building material, it means that many of our older remains, when you're going back um, four or five thousand years, that a piece of um, dry stone walling can begin to blend in with a natural cliff line and it can be quite difficult to tell where one stops and the other begins, sometimes even when you're on land. Um, I think you can see here uh, one of the nice, beautifully um, tidied up and maintained uh, Neolithic tomb sites on the island of Rousey. But you can see the way in which um, you can have faces of walling and they do begin to mimic bedrock. And then you can kind of imagine, well, if you're underwater, how much more difficult is, is it going to be? So we had to kind of try and think, OK, uh, and I think other people have taken this approach. We've heard one or two um, people talk about it. Well, what is left of your what does it, what do your prehistoric sites comprise? And um, really just very kind of grossly dividing it into small and large and thinking about smaller scale features. Well, perhaps these are um, related more to some of the older sites. Um, Mesolithic, Paleolithic sites, you might be talking about discolorations of um, sediment, uh, post holes, pits, halves, collections of finds, th uh, things like that. Uh, moving slightly forward in time, obviously coming into the Neolithic, uh, you're going to get larger scale features, walling, settings, um, ditches, sort of positive and negative features all added into the mix. But what you've got to do then when you're working with a submerged landscape is to consider, well, what are these sites going to look like underwater? How do they degrade? What materials do they accumulate? Um, you have to look at local issues, the context, uh, wave energy, topography, shelter, things like that. It's a complex picture. Really what it boils down to is and believe me, there's enough ballast dumps on, on the seabed of Orkney. Um, when is a pile of stones on the seabed just a pile of stones on the seabed, particularly uh, when it's covered by dense growths uh, of seaweed? And we have seaweeds up here that some people get very excited about. So you can't just rip it all off or anything. Um, nevertheless, we do have stone features on the seabed. The problem has been 
uh, validating them, if you like, as anthropogenic. And you can see here, uh, again, two very kind of gross divisions, but we have uh, vertical stones and indeed occasionally settings of vertical stones. Uh, we have horizontal stones. These are nice, particularly clean ones, not covered. Um, with seaweed, but I think you can see that it can be very difficult. There's no nice um, welcoming little historic Scotland markers or collections of skulls or, or even um, timbers lying around to suggest that something else might be going on here. And so we have to think a bit more broadly. And in many ways, the technique, the kind of thought processes that we're adopting they're very similar to the way that you work on land. I mean, essentially, we're looking at the context of the features. We're looking at their position in the landscape, at um, any patterning we might be able to see. Have we got individual features? Have we got linear arrangements? Things that might not occur naturally, geometric, symmetry, that sort of thing. Uh, and moving to a slightly more sort of um, broader scale, are we getting layered stonework? Are we getting scattered stonework forming patterns? What's the, the background matrix like? Are we getting stones um, marking out in a, in a softer sediment? That sort of thing. But of course, the problem that you have is when you're standing on a hillside looking at a pile of stones in the corner of the field, one thing you'll do instinctively is raise your eye and look around you to get the overall context. You might try and step back a bit to see where are other sites and things. If you're underwater and you do that sort of thing, here in Orkney anyway, you just lose sight of the, of the feature you're looking at. So it's not always as easy as just eyeballing something. We have to deploy other techniques. And you can just see here some of the sorts of things that we're beginning to come up with. This is a, a, an isolated feature uh, just to the north of the island of Damsey in the Bay of Firth that we came up with um, very early on. It looks really exciting. I think this also brings out another of the issues that we have underwater. I've mentioned the abundant weed growth and things. But I think um, one of the things that we have to be very aware of is that the eye will interpret things in terms of what it thinks it wants to see, what it thinks you want to see. So it's very, very easy to um, make this out to be something. It would be lovely to see it as some sort of portal or table tomb or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, the reality isn't quite as nice as perhaps the, the photograph might um, lead us to believe. Um, we can have stone settings more um, perhaps relating to horizontal uh, features, beddings of stones and things. Again, uh, this is in the Bay of Firth, just off the island of Damsey. Um, very difficult to validate whether this sort of thing is actually anthropogenic or not. There are other um, features, these little settings. You've seen one earlier of uh, vertical stones. Um, there's an area just to the north of Damsey where we, we've got quite a lot of these. And uh, interestingly, in this case, um, it relates to, or they're, they're very close to, uh, an early Christian church site, a uh, chapel site, which is eroding into the sea. And we're pretty certain that um, they probably relate to the lost graveyard from the chapel site. It's one of the few early Christian sites in Orkney that doesn't have a graveyard, even though there are actually plenty of stories relating to people being buried there. Um, obviously, in this case, it would be a fairly recent inundation probably really related to some sort of barrier breach. The island is um, degrading due to barrier breaches even in, in the present day. Um, and you can see here similar vertical stones in a graveyard elsewhere in Orkney on the um, island of Bursi. And then we have more large, we have bigger features and We've really divided these into two, um, into topographic features and kind of piles of stone. Um, this is a feature that we found very early on. Uh, we've called it the main mound. It's one that's been particularly interesting to us. Obviously a very nice circular shape. 
Um, sitting here, you can see uh, in its uh, topographical context, you can dive down on it. There's some lovely stonework on the top until you remember that, of course, Orkney stone breaks naturally into these sort of slabs. So we can't ever be 100% certain that they're actually laying. Uh, what we can do is look around the whole site, look at the different angles of dip and bedding and things. Um, you can see it's much steeper around the edge, it, it flattens off in the middle. Uh, we can start to get some overall information. We looked at um, when the site would have been inundated. It's likely to have submerged by around about six and a half thousand years ago. So not an obvious contender for a Neolithic site. Um, at the moment, we're tending to think this site is most likely to be natural, but it is very difficult to come up with uh, either natural or anthropogenic explanations for the site. It's something we're still working on. And then for the, the more the kind of pile of stones, if you like, moving over to the west where we've been working in the Loch of Stennis, partly to give uh, context to the World Heritage Sites and the site at Nessabrogo, which um, all lie along the isthmus there. Um, and uh, we've produced a model of, uh, in fact, of the site uh, in the early Neolithic, around about the time that the Nessabrogga uh, work there would have been starting. But for the point of view of this lecture, just uh, we're interested in a mound site over on the other side of the loch. Here you can see it showing up, and here with the, the bathymetry, um, showing up very, very nicely. And in this case, the stonework sits more on top of the bedrock, and um, we're, again, we're still sadly are sort of, um, we were going to do some diving on that. It got a bit um, caught up in COVID and things. So that's still got to be done. But one of the things that's interesting about this site is that it, it's very similar in uh, size and also in shape to some of the very earliest Neolithic tombs in Orkney, many of which sit down at present day um, sea level. And here you can just see uh, a nice reconstruction, uh, sketch fab reconstruction of the, the one on Rousey. Um, and so uh, that's something we're tending to verge to think more towards anthropogenic, although um, we need to, to verify that still. So just to sum up, um, we definitely have sites, interpreting them, verifying them, much more difficult. Uh, what we have found is that we've got our results by focusing in targeting very specific areas, particularly shallow protected waters. But that has shown us that even in a high energy environment, um, you can get results, that it's not totally uh, devoid of archaeology, if you like. Um, and that really means, of course, that local topography, you really have to understand the local topography. You have to be able to look at things like offshore barriers and so on, that these are highly significant in the way in which both inundation will play out and in which survival of sites will play out. Uh, we found, in fact, that diving, we've perhaps done less than we might have done, uh, thought we would do with divers. It's very useful, but it doesn't always provide all the answers and really we've worked in by going through a reconstruction of the landscape and just because I'm an archaeologist I kind of like to bring everything back to the people I think one of the things um, well we have to kind of make sure we're not just running with all our assumptions we want to constantly question our assumptions is this focus on the coast is it really there is local sea level rise a threat? I think one thing we have to remember is that sea level rise is a big threat to us today because we've lived through centuries, millennia of stability. But for the people who are living in Orkney in early prehistory, sea level rise is just the way of the world. It's the way things were. They didn't know it was going to stop. We've got hindsight, but they didn't. And I think we forget that quite often. So how do they um, subsume this kind of changing world into their mindset, into the way they live, into their scientific knowledge? Um, how does it influence behaviour, stories, that sort of thing? I'm just going to leave you with those questions. Absolutely no answers. Um, and just turn to the last slide to thank everybody, to thank you for listening, and to say that thankfully I've got Richard and Martin here to answer all the difficult questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Caroline. What a fantastic presentation. It's just great to see these, um, those images of Orkney and the work that you've done so far. Are there any questions from anyone in the chat? I can't see anything in the chat, so I'm just wondering whether there are any questions. We've got a little bit of time before our next speaker. Uh, here we go, we do have one. Oh, they're coming in now. <laughs> uh, so the first one is from Trevor Faulkner. Oh, they're all coming in now. And they ask, um, Shetland, or they say Shetland is also in a four bulge area and has been uh, falling relative to sea level in the Holocene, opposite to the inland Scotland uh, mainland. Is some marine archaeology being searched for there? We've done a little bit of work uh, in Shetland around Lerwick, where there's um, some nice submerged forest remains and a rather nice Neolith Cax. But yes, Shetland's very interesting because, of course, um, it's uh, even more uh, deeply bedded, if you like, the submerged landscape than Orkney. But as far as I know, and people might know um, a different uh, some work going on, but I don't think there's any submerged landscape work being done there. In fact, um, when I've been at a couple of seminars in Shetland, uh, awareness wasn't high that there was a submerged landscape. So one university had had students searching the present coastline for material relating to things that, um, yeah, was rather interesting when you pointed out that the coastline at the time they were interested wouldn't have been at present day height. So it, it does show, in fact, going back to in many ways what Jeff uh, has always talked about, that we still have to get information out there that uh, submerged landscapes even exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's so important. Um, we have another question from Bjorn Nielsen, who asks, what about faunal remains and wood? So far, nothing. I think that's right, is it, Martin? Uh, yeah, no, no, um, no faunal remains that um, have come up in any any of our work. Um, there is wood. I mean, there's the the, the plank feature, the plank um, in the Bay of Ireland, um, or, or the piece of large timber. Um, so there are bits of of, of wood in there. Um, there are some nice peats in the Bay of Firth. Um, submerged peats, because um, we've got a, a series of Mesolithic lakes that um, transform in, in, in the late Mesolithic period as, as sea level rises. So, so in those situations, yes, we've got, we've got, uh, but not worked wood at the moment. Okay, one last question um, from, uh, I have to see, um, Peter. Peter, from Peter. Yeah, Peter, um, Alexander, um, uh, sorry, it keeps moving. Rowley Conway has asked, is there any indication that red deer or large ungulates were introduced in the Mesolithic? The million dollar question. I think um, Jackie published a paper on that, didn't she, about the Neolithic. I know it, I think when they looked at the Neolithic red deer population, they're getting, am I right, two um, strands, one of which they think was introduced at some point. Um, but although there are antlers from peat bogs, they've all been more recent, they've all been Bronze Age. So at the moment, I don't think we have any red deer um, or faunal material going back to Mesolithic Orkney which isn't to say it's not here, it may just be that people haven't really looked for it. 